The Man in Line with Andy Wint. Fast of I, good afternoon. Welcome to Man in Line on Manx Radio. We're open line through to one today. It's been ages since we had a chat. Thanks to uh, Alex Brindley and Phil Gorn for uh, manning the pumps last week. So a lot's happened since uh, we've lost the airport director, or will be losing the airport director. We don't know how much the C terminal is going to cost in Liverpool yet. Not even slightly. And it's fairly certain now we can forget Sunday papers. What have we come to? When was the last time you can remember a, a guaranteed delivery of Sunday papers on the Isle of Man? I'll tell you when, when we used to fly them here. It seems that the newspaper publishers now don't want to fund the paper, the plane. They used to fund the cost of getting the papers over here on a Sunday morning. Now that doesn't happen, so we have to rely on the boat, which does, if a bit ish, you know, kind of might do it sometimes. And another bit of civilization seems to have just crumbled off the Isle of Man. Sunday papers. I know lots of people, certainly people under 40 years of age, don't buy papers, don't read papers. They'll maintain they do read papers because they're online, but they're not really newspapers, are they? They're news sites. So I just wonder whether it's time to find out exactly how much the newspaper publishers paid to get the newspapers over here and whether or not it might be worth, you know, clubbing together. If the wholesalers don't want to, can't fund it, if they don't want to do that, uh, the newspapers really, I mean, are newspapers a right? Are they a privilege? Is it something you should look forward to? Or is it just something that we accept will go at some point and perhaps sooner rather than later? Any thoughts? Uh, Dodgy says, uh, my generation get our news from social media, said Dodgy. And I'm in my 40s. Fine, that's great, Dodgy. However, at some point, that news, that news, that journalism will have been written by a journalist employed by a newspaper. Get the connection? So if the journalist isn't employed by the newspaper because the newspaper doesn't exist, there will be no social media journalism just social media opinion and down that road anyway just a thought it's just something else that's disappeared from the Isle of Man like um, Isle of Man bank branches other bank branches Saturday collections for post the post just something else that's disappeared any thoughts text email call whatsapp and uh, we got Wayne first with us on Man in Line today hi Wayne how you doing mate you okay good thanks yeah, one thing about the papers, as I was a kid, I used to go down and rap and help put them in the van and stuff. The courier that got made here, which is now made in England, I believe. Yeah, it is. It's printed in the northwest in England. It's a bit of crackers, anyway. It was one thing uh, about I wanted to mention. Why are they putting taxis around Springfield Avenue Way? I don't understand. The TT course is nearly a circuit as the surface, you know? Yeah. But it, it's like patchwork everywhere. You, if you go over there, you can see... Uh, Springfield Road. Springfield Avenue. Oh, Springfield Avenue, 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 yeah. The road going to it as well. Like, why don't they cut half it out, as they do, on proper roads, and fill it half in, half out? I don't get it. It's just patches everywhere, and there will be more patches coming. And when was the last time they actually did the whole road, the, the length of the road? Oh, I'm nearly 40 now, so it's been there since I've been a kid. Right, so it's not been done since the middle of the 1980s, you reckon? Well, patchwork, yeah, but that always blows, you know. The water gets in it, it freezes, and away it goes, cracks again. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder why that's not. A, I wonder why they don't see that as a priority, Wayne. Exactly. That's what I mean, uh, it's, it's beyond me. Like, if, I, if, if it was my firm, I'd say this and take, stop the traffic. You know, it's not a busy road. 
but they'll do it on a busy road and even bigger stretch and cause more mayhem. Now, presumably, there are people who live up and down there who pay road tax. Well, that's what I was going to say. I didn't really want to say it. People are hard work and are paying for this, you know? Yeah. And, and driving along a 40-year-old patchwork road. Basically, yeah. Mm. You see oh. all the heavy wagons going through there, and they just about get through, and that, that's beyond me why they go, go through Spring Valley. You're talking one of them wagons full of food and all that. Yeah. Okay. All right, well... Just that, one more thing, mate. Can yep. I mention a great big shout-out to Oasis getting back on? Oh, uh, right. Well, yeah. We are going, We are going to go... Me, Sonny, uh, Darren and Graham. So, made up I am, made okay. up. And, okay, so yeah, Wayne, yeah. maybe you could answer a question for me. What's that mean? Who's going to throw the first punch, Noel or Liam? Well, this is it. I don't think you met up. Well, uh, that's what he said, didn't he? He said, uh, it's all right, you following me, but you've got to be in the same room as me. So, <laughs> And on stage yeah. together as well. Well, apparently it's going to cost them half a billion just to get them. Band up, back up, and go on again. Righty, wow. Oh, well, well, have a good time. Brilliant, thank you. Good to hear from you. Thanks. Uh, um, yeah, Oasis getting back together. There must be some tectonic plates changing somewhere. Julian's with us now. Hi, Julian. Hi, Andy. How you doing? Very well, thanks. Yeah, um, Wayne's um, point also raises another question, which is uh, it's getting a bit eye watering. That car tax makes you wonder where it's going, really. Well, certainly not on the roads, is it? I mean, it's a source of taxation, really. Well, I've been out and about today, and it's pretty bad in a lot of places where you'd expect it to be a lot better. So, I don't know. I mean, you know, I think, is it three years or younger, the cars go on a CO2 tax now, which um, in some cases puts up about 40% higher than when it was on its um, CC. So, that's uh, poisonous CO2, uh, Andy. Hmm. Um, I'd like to talk about the current problems at air traffic control at Ronald's Way, yep. um, following yet another spate of diversions from London a few days ago. Um, I'm surprised that with all the air traffic control problems in recent years, we haven't had any public statement from the head of air traffic services, Jeff Pugh. Um, there's anecdotal evidence that morale amongst the air traffic controllers is at an all-time low with stories of conflict between the controllers and management. Uh, and there's a couple of interesting points. When the, uh, the former airport director, Anne Reynolds, placed an advert in 2019 for an air traffic control manager, the job title was altered from senior air traffic officer to head of air traffic services and also downgraded the requirement for the applicant to hold a CAA, air traffic control officer, qualification from previously essential to desirable. So obviously that wasn't quite so important. Yeah. The other point to note is that Jeff Pugh is the first air traffic manager at Ronaldsway not to hold a CAA certified air traffic controller qualification, which also has the problem that he can't step in if you have a, a person that goes sick. Um, only a couple of weeks ago, yet another air traffic controller resigned from Ronaldsway after just a few short years of employment, compounding the problems at the airport. And, and surely it's essential for Jeff Pugh to make an official statement to clarify exactly what these ongoing problems are in the control tower before more air traffic controllers decide to resign and all the airlines could pull out. So I think it's crucial that air traffic control staff feel valued and morale is kept high. And well, I mean, the fact is, it's a legal requirement. I mean, it's a legal requirement to have an air traffic controller. If air traffic controllers aren't on duty, nothing can happen, as we know, because it's happened in the past. So, uh, as you say, we've not heard anything. We've heard, um, you know, words and, and schemes and what have you to recruit people. And we know because of COVID, it was very difficult to recruit air traffic controllers. And consequently... It's a very transportable skill. They can go here, there, and everywhere. But the trouble is that without enough air traffic controllers, we've now got our flights squeezed into little tunnels, um, tunnels of time, and consequently that's one of the things that's caused the problems, that caused the problems outside with car parking because everybody's getting shoved together and we've still only got one luggage trolley or one crew that do the luggage trolley. So it would seem if they could sort out the air traffic control problem, lots of other things would fall into place. Well, 
from what you said then, I seem to remember there was a question that was asked in Tinwald last year about the number of trainee air traffic controllers. And I think the answer given was close to 18 and that everyone will be fully trained by the end of 2023. Um, and I just wonder how many fully trained um, air traffic controllers do we currently have at the moment? Because obviously, I think um, the other day, those two London flights, the airport was due to close at 8.45 without, you know, any extension. But they actually closed 15 minutes earlier at 8.30. Yeah. But, you know, I, I remember years and years ago, uh, I was on a very a severely delayed flight back to the island. I think it was Heathrow. It might even have been Manx Airlines. Um, and the air traffic control staff willingly stepped in and kept the airport open. And I think it was after 11 o'clock at night. And my, th- my thinking is that goodwill needs to be regained immediately. So I think we need to find out, is the morale of the air traffic controllers very low at the moment? What is going on? Because, you know, people might think, oh, well, whatever. But as soon as flights start, can't go off the island because the airlines are pulling out because it's costing them a fortune to put people up in hotels, because the airport's closing even earlier than its published closing time, this is going to cause major problems. So I think it needs to be addressed sooner rather than later. Well, something somewhere is obviously wrong. Uh, something something has gone wrong somewhere. Uh, whether or not people talk about issues or problems or you know th- contingencies or what have you, it's not working. Uh, because we can all t- we can all tell that it's not working, and I think there's a isn't there a phrase in management own the problem, just say yes oh, yeah. there is a problem and we're going to do something about it, but at the moment well, we seem to be pushed from pillar to post, and obviously with Mr. Cobb now departing after doing just over two years, we're now in a position of limbo where they're either going to be recruiting or shuffling people within the airport to run the airport, and I think at the bottom line the bottom of all this, it's a bit like the steam packet uh, it's a bit like we're talking about the roads now these are our roads you know it's our steam packet and it's our airport you know this is owned it's run by the doi but it's for the convenience of the people and businesses of the isle of man it's not there it's not a job creation scheme it's there to do a job yeah but it has the ramifications of that you know, if you can't get business people here, let's suppose Logan Air pulls out. And don't forget, they were very good over COVID, weren't they? I mean, they were running flights every day. Well, let's face it. I mean, they, I think they were subvented, but I mean, they absolutely, yeah. they, they saved our skins during, uh, because nobody else was there. Yeah. So, I mean, as you said rightly before, management needs to step up. So let's have Jeff Pugh. Head of Air Traffic Services, let's have him on the radio and we'll find out what's going on. Because this lack of transparency seems to be um, pervading everywhere at the moment. So let's have a let's shine a magnifying glass and a light on this one and get this sorted. Because, I mean, connections to the island, uh, they're having a bit of a problem at the moment, aren't they, Andy? And as you say, can you just, and, and as there was last Sunday when the Gatwick flight turned back over Hertfordshire and went back to Gatwick and the London City flight went into Liverpool. Just imagine, just imagine there was um, a businessman, businesswoman, prominent, wealthy, looking to invest in the Isle of Man, had been sold the Isle of Man by the good people at Locate Isle of Man and Business Isle of Man, and they decided to come over a bank holiday weekend and turn back over Watford and went back to Gatwick. What must they think? Absolutely, and you know... That city flight that was uh, that had to divert to Liverpool, they took off within eight minutes of the posted time to depart, and they were due to get in early because there's always that sort of twenty minutes built in to the your arrival time, which is why if it goes around the right time, you get in a bit early. Um, but the the airport was closed fifteen minutes earlier, and you know if there is some problems going on there. You've got to see if, if, if morale at air traffic control is this bad, we need to get that goodwill back if this is the problem. But we need to have some talk with the management and find out what is going on because it, it seems to be, as usual, a bit like the FOIs for the steam packet. You just can't get any answers. Well, um, I mean, all we can do is see now because obviously Mr. Cobb is going to be departing, he's going on to other things. But whoever, I mean, maybe Mr. Cobb will say something before he leaves, maybe he'll do a, a debrief, maybe he'll talk about it. 
I, I think, I don't want to speak on behalf of Mr. Cobb, but I think there are certain constraints because obviously DOI runs things. He, you know, Mr. Cobb only runs certain things within the airport. Uh, lots of other things are run by DOI. And Jeff Pugh runs the air traffic control. So let's get him on. I mean, he is, the, he, he is head of air traffic services. We haven't even heard from him. So let's, let's get him on. I think it would be very interesting to hear what's going on. OK, all right. Appreciate that. Thanks, Julian. Thanks, Andy. Cheers. All right, 22 minutes past 12. There were Sunday papers last weekend, uh, says Fran Francis Frankie. Uh, why are we shoveling vast sums of money into the Peel Group with the Liverpool Ferry Terminal fiasco? I think you're about four years too late there, Fran, to be quite honest. That's a kind of retro problem we can do nothing about. We signed a contract to build our ferry terminal on that land. I think we've got a lease, haven't we, on it? Um, you're quite right. The Peel Group um, owned, they bought the Mersey Docks and Harbour Board, and they own all that land, as they own a lot on the Wirral side as well, as they own Hesham Port as well, as they own Liverpool John Lennon Airport. It's a very successful company. It just happens, I don't know whether you remember, but it was... Um, Former MHK Chris Robertshaw said, uh, we sent uh, National League negotiators in to negotiate with the Premier League. When we talk, I mean, you, you simply can't blame the Peel Group for doing what big companies do, and that is to um, take advantage of their advantages. Do you know if other islands such as Jersey and Guernsey have the same problems with boats and planes and newspapers? Maybe uh, some of your listeners who have links and have lived in those places could advise if they encounter the same issues, says Lim. As far as planes are concerned, Lynn, in the Channel Islands, there's uh, an airline called Orinyi. Orinyi is um, uh, uh, Jerry Ayres, I think, for Alderney. And they've had Alderney Airways for years and years and years. It's, again, subvented by the government in Jersey. I think it lo lost last time about £7 million a year. But it makes sure that all the islands are connected, Alderney to Guernsey to Jersey and links into London and links elsewhere. So they have their own airline. That's as simple as that. Uh, that's the way that they do it. We don't have our own airline. Of course, we did have something akin to our own airline, which was Manx Airlines, it was a private business. And we were offered the chance to buy, to get a golden share in Manx Airlines. And um, it was turned down at the time. So again, it's a retro problem. You're wrestling with wraiths, um, battling ghosts in the past. We are where we are nowadays. And we're in the situation with the airport where we're struggling with air traffic control. We're very reliant on EasyJet and Logan Air at the moment. So, well, John's on now. Hi, John. Yeah, hi, Andy. It's, um, I don't, we were on the flight with, from Gatwick uh, on, on Sunday night, and we were, we were obviously turned, turned around when we were fairly close to the Isle of Man. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, actually on the, on the flight was Dr. Allenson, the finance minister as well. So he got a, he got a bit of a ear for, from a few people, uh, including my wife. What, were they, what did people say to him? Well, be, I mean, basically, I mean, it, this is this is disgusting. It's supposed to have been sorted out. Um, I, I, what I said to him was, uh, Dr. Allenson, you need to sort the basics out. If you can't sort the basics out, forget about another fifteen thousand people coming. They just won't come when you when you have that sort of disruption because it is clearly d very disruptive. Uh, for, from our perspective, you know, obviously, you know, we're we're, we're getting on now, but. Um, um, so we're, we're not economically active, but we do contribute a lot to the island in, in financially in, in other ways. Uh, but it's, um, you know, it's a very irritating, um, I mean, if, if it was weather related, it, frankly, there's absolutely nothing they can do about that. Um, but you know, the, it, the disruption is, is, was upsetting for people, if you can understand that. Yourself. Where did you stay on Sunday night? Well, on Sunday night, we, we, like, uh, we, we managed to get hold of our daughter in the island, and she booked the Sofitel, because uh, uh, we'd stayed the night before. But um, actually, a number of people um, 
who uh, uh, was easy just to uh, arrange for. They actually stayed at the Hilton, so it appears. So that 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 works. I mean, we 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 had insurance, so we didn't worry about the financial dimension. Although, from an insurance perspective, this is the fourth time we've had uh, to claim. For that disruption, and what are they? What are the mechanics of making a, a claim? Is it complicated or fairly straightforward, John? But it was quite complicated, to be f- to, to be fair. And I mean, obviously, this, the, these are, these are rules from the insurers rather than from the airline. The airline, I thought, to be fair to them, handled it quite well, as well as they could could have done it. You know, I mean, I think that it was a total surprise. Their staff, in fact, even offered to stay on the island overnight. Um, and um, and 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 wait because and, cause we were so close to the island, but they, you know, obviously they had refusal. I mean, I understand there are rules about air traffic control, etc. Uh, but they they said they uh, they'd worked you know for the last 13 years. They'd never experienced this anywhere else. Um, so it was quite a you know, irrita- you know irritation for them as well. What do we do, John? How do we get by this? <clears throat> well, if. Yeah, but it's back to basics. I mean, you, you hear many politicians talk about get back to basics. And if you don't get the mechanics working on basics, you're not going to get the rest of it working. Now, you've got, you've got, and transportation is basic. We, you know, we'd been on a cruise, and one of the places we went to was, was Guernsey as part of that. Um, so, you know, we, we, yeah, I mean, I'm sure all islands have disruption from weather. But nothing you can do about that. Um, I'm not. A, I'm not an expert in how to run an airport, but yeah. it, uh, but I will tell you one one thing. I, I, what I did run was a, a very large company, and we had nearly 100,000 staff. So I do know something about running companies. And um, if, frankly, if if I was losing st- uh, senior management running an airport, and and I'd run uh, lost the number that they have been losing on the island. There, there is something basically wrong with what's happening on on the airport. Well, you may not be an expert in aviation, but you're very important in the equation, John, because you're the paying customer. Yeah, of course. And, you know, um, we all also go on the Manx moment. We've been disrupted many times there, too, as well. So it's... Uh, um, so it it doesn't give a good a good image, and uh, um, at, the, at the very least, there were people coming on the island. I, I know for some of the races, so, so they were disrupted for a day. You know, obviously. Okay. Um, All right. So, I mean, I'm saddened for them. I appreciate that, John. Thanks for calling today. Thank you, Andy. Good Bye. to hear from you. Twenty nine minutes past twelve. Um, I mean, really, are we getting to the stage now where instead of a two day travel off the Isle of Man if you're doing links to hotels and to holidays and what are we now talking about a three day window where you can just about guarantee that you're going to get off the Isle of Man has travel become a privilege you know is it is it is it a privilege if things go right or should we actually expect the basics to happen as John said if we're trying to entice 15,000 people here how do you explain that away? Uh, do listeners know about the disgrace at the sea terminal last night? Passengers on the cancel sailing turfed out of the building at midnight last night. Appalling, embarrassing, says Julian in Port St. Mary. Appalling, embarrassing. Thank goodness for the good folk at Barbary Coast. This appears to have flown below the, the radar. Didn't know about that, Julian. Is it true? If anybody else can testify to that last night, passengers taken uh, basically turfed out of the sea terminal at midnight last night. Thanks also to um, why did the airport close early the other evening? Did somebody fall ill, meaning there weren't enough air traffic controllers on duty, says Pete. Uh, Well, Pete, as I think we've mentioned umpteen times, uh, air traffic controllers are mandated to do a certain amount of time in the seat, as it were, in the air traffic controller's seat, and they do have to have breaks, periodic breaks, um, which uh, I think a lot of this goes back to the confusion over fatigue breaks, which lots of people read as tea breaks. Their fatigue breaks. Um, if only they could have come up with a better, more illustrative term for the breaks that they have, then maybe that would have been better because lots of people now still refer to them as tea breaks. They are fatigue breaks. T 
tiredness breaks, if you like. They have to take a certain amount of time away from the screen and the responsibility. And without, if they don't, I mean, A, that's a, a, that's a, a, a mandatable offense. I mean, that's a disciplinary offense, possibly a criminal offense if anything goes wrong. So you can't play around with air traffic control shifts, and nor should you as well. Uh, if anybody's uh, got any um, opinions and facts regarding Jersey and Guernsey, well, he's coming to tell us. Um, green energy is the only way forward for our future generations, and wind farms are the best green energy. Erie Stain is the geographically the best location. That's Big John in Ramsey on 857. And John also says part of travelling is delays. That's... Uh, the case that's traveling exercise patience uh, says john and jed's with us now hi jed hi i'd be really interested to know uh, dr allenson's view as being uh, involved in what happened on sunday evening with the gatwick flight and maybe he could probe further than we can or maybe your news team could just identify the fact that there must have been a conversation in the control tower for the ATC staff, that they would have known that they'd be terminating their service times. And they would have known that there would have been two flights uh, coming in. And they'd be fully aware that these flights would be in midair. Now, apart from the duty of care issue and the environmental costs and the huge inconvenience, there must have been a conversation to say, look, um, we're going to let these planes take off. And we're going to um, turn the lights off, so to speak. So that's one way of looking at it. Or is the blame on the other side with the uh, pilots who um, may have not made the necessary checks with the uh, destination on the Isle of Man? It's, it's, it's quite a conundrum, isn't it? It is. We don't quite know, as you say. I mean, I've heard anecdotal evidence about the fact that, you know, perhaps they know that, you know, how can I put it? They what do they say that? Oh, an air, uh, an, air, uh, an aircraft goes tech conveniently, which causes a stopover somewhere. So we don't really know. There are various uh, various points in the uh, in the chain where things are pulled and things go wrong, and obviously the flight doesn't happen. Uh, but as I mentioned to John, the important thing is it's the passenger that it gets it in the neck every time, Jed. Well, in this instance, there will have been conversations during Sunday because these things just don't you know, come out of thin air. And there will have been conversations between the staff on, on the Isle of Man at the airport to say, look, there's a chance that we're not going to be able to take these two flights. OK, that, that seems pretty straightforward. And I'd like to know what those conversations were because if they allowed those, those flights to take off, or not even give the staff uh, operating those flights due warning, yeah. which you think they'd be entitled to do. There's some real questions to be asked, isn't there? Well, plainly, something's gone wrong somewhere, and somebody within the airport knows exactly where it went wrong, which brick didn't go in the wall. And it's mm. almost like we, the passengers, uh, are on the outside with our nose pressed against the window. We don't quite know what's happening. We just know that it doesn't go. And you feel very powerless, Jed. Mm, well, I, I've got no real understanding of air uh, traffic control matters, but on a Sunday night when you've got two flights to come into the Isle of Man, you haven't got a great deal to think about. I think, that, I think that's fair enough to say. And if you're monitor, monitoring those two flights, then you know that they're going to leave those respective airports and nothing is said and then they're, they're flying over Watford and then they end up turning back. I think there's some duty issues here. And I'd really like Dr. Allenson or the Manx Radio and News team to get to the bottom of them. I think we all would, Jed, to be quite honest. It'd be, it'd be nice to know who's responsible for it, whether or not it's the airport mm. director, whether it's DOI, whether you see it's uh, Mr. Pugh, who's the air traffic control boss, who exactly it is. Because let's face it, with, the, with everybody concerned on both those flights, that and, and not only that, but the people who were flying back 
uh, to Gatwick on the Sunday night mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. This has affected, you know, with knock-ons and families and what have you. You know, this is it's into the thousands of people that this has affected. Let alone the reputational damage of a bank holiday weekend pair of flights that didn't make it. And sometimes, you know, our, our bonkers approach on the green agenda, where people are sitting on the fence or off the fence or underneath the fence, and all that fuel that is getting burned. When you look back over the year when we had the um, tea breaks, uh, the fatigue breaks, sorry, and the amount of uh, aircraft circling around the Isle of Man, just jettisoning all these fumes, all these greenhouse gases. And yet, on the other hand, you know, we're, we're having to, uh, what can I say, take some remedies ourselves yeah. to, um, to satisfy uh, government policy on, on green matters. Um, it just doesn't stack up. It really doesn't. So I, I just look forward to Dr. Allenson. I feel sorry that he will have got it in the neck of those passengers, especially if he was on a, a leisure flight, say. Um, but hopefully, you know, we can have some answers. It's just that point is that when someone sat on the Isle of Man and they look at the flight um, uh, timetable and they're thinking, well, do we let them know we're going to be short or what? Well, sure as anything, we know. I mean, I I sound a bit doubting Thomas when I say this, but this is going to happen again. It's bound to happen again. Well, if it continues to happen, I think, you know, with your introduction into the programme, um, it's not really doing the Isle of Man very good uh, reputationally. And you'll see in the last two weeks in the headlines, we've got a a sequence of um, negative stories surrounding the island. And I'm just a little bit perturbed that we're not having anybody stepping up and accounting, you know, to to the Manx public about these stories. And really, there's no sign of any any true leadership. Would that would that be fair to say? Okay. All right, Jed. I appreciate it. Thanks for calling. Thank you. Cheers now. 22 minutes before one. Um, It's Wednesday, and you know that means in our 60th anniversary year, we're uh, trawling back into Kelly's eye. Peter Kelly has gone back to work as he and David Callister, the late David Callister, cast an eye over Onken Commissioner's building. That's after Man in Line today. Retro back to Kelly's eye in our 60th anniversary year. We interrupt this broadcast to inform all our listeners about the huge range of bathrooms and showers on display at Pacesetter. Yes, you all know that Pacesetter is known as the island's largest tile store, but I'm here to tell you that their bathroom displays are truly inspirational. Visit Pacesetter on Harris Terrace, where you'll discover a fabulous collection of stylish bathrooms. There's something to suit everyone, with design available. Pacesetter bathrooms and showers to show off about. Oh, not again. Oh, that Jack from next door really needs to improve his left foot. Oh, don't worry. The storm did the damage last time and it was easy to get a greenhouse pane from Manx Glass and Glazing. Manx Glass and Glazing don't just do the big jobs. Visit them on Snugborough Trading Estate for all your glazing repairs and supplies. From glass tabletops and picture frame glass to greenhouse glazing, along with good old-fashioned customer service and product knowledge. Manx Glass and Glazing. You're smashing. Out and about this summer, EVA service stations have everything you need to make the most of it. Hot and cold food, chilled wine and beers, barbecue essentials and more. You can even pick up your lottery tickets at our stations across the island. Fill up, fuel up with Ellen Vannin Fuels. Visit us at evf.co.im Stocks and offers may vary between locations. Do you know a scrap Because I've got scrap to clear Causing copper press and lead and I need cash for beer. What? You don't know a scrap man? Castains of Foxel is the one for you. Castains will take all scrap metal and is also licensed for dry cell and lead acid batteries. So don't delay. Ring 801 337 now. So now we know a scrap man and all our scrap's been cleared. Ring 801 337. Then have cash for beer called cost dies today and get yourself a beer. Hello, this is H. On this evening's Spotlight, I'm not being heretical as I say we're poetical, as we hear from the new Manx Bard, Jordan Kenyuk, and the current youth bard, Neil Kalari, and also pay tribute to the Manx folk music legend, John Kinnean, who passed away last week. Spotlight this evening, just after 5.30, and available as a podcast straight after broadcast by the Manx Radio website or your favourite podcast provider. Spotlight, a spark of cultural warmth in the late summer's chill. 
The Man in Line with Andy Wint. 19 minutes before one it is, Wednesday lunchtime on the Isle of Man, on Man in Line, open line till one. And Brian's with us, Brian Kelly from Manlink Travel. Hi, Brian. Hi, good afternoon. Um, so uh, what, um, what's your take on the, the air link situation and the air traffic control situation? Well, what I can perhaps do is throw a little bit of a balance into the situation. Uh, we operate uh, travel businesses in both Jersey and Guernsey, so we're very familiar as to what's happening down there. And uh, let me assure you, they've got you know similar problems. Uh, they are slightly different, but they are similar problems, which is basically a lot of cancelled flights. So if maybe explain the situation down there. So Orini uh, are owned by the states of Guernsey government. And uh, for the last couple of years, they have been profitable. Uh, prior to that, they had a number of years through COVID, obviously, where they were making substantial losses. Uh, but it is controlled by the government and owned by the government. The current situation is, and this is a, a general problem across Europe, across the globe, with a certain type of aircraft, which is the ATR-72, which Logan operates uh, on the Isle of Man, as do Emerald, and pretty much the full fleet of Arini is uh, the ATR-72. Uh, through COVID, and because of COVID, uh, getting uh, uh, servicing and getting spare parts for these aircraft has proved to be extremely difficult. And this has caused uh, many cancellations and many delays, not just by Arini, but also by other airlines who are utilising that particular aircraft. I mean, Br- Brian, so that, Brian, the, the public may be... Uh, maybe kind of um, how can I put it taken aback by the fact you, they can't get spares they can't get spares uh, there, there are not enough spares being made uh, to cope with the demand so uh, for example we use a, an airline called Alci Express we're a Danish airline and we do direct flights from the Alamand to to uh, Copenhagen and Sonneborg and they have to take the engine off the aircraft boxes and send it to Singapore to be serviced because there's no capacity in Europe to have that to have that engine serviced locally in, in a European situation. So that's how difficult the position is. So a lot of cancellations and a lot of uh, problems that you're seeing re- relating to that particular aircraft will be with us for, for, for probably several years to come. Now, Aridi, for example, have, have uh, chartered in two aircraft for the whole of the season. And last week, because of more problems, uh, they've actually brought in another three aircraft, different type of aircraft. Uh, most of the aircraft they're bringing in are uh, uh, Q400s, the Dash, uh, which are probably XYB, uh, and a similar type of, of uh, aircraft with a uh, similar uh, number of seats. So, for example, I was down in Guernsey two weeks ago, came from my flight at 5.30 to London City, London City, and at 6.30 the flight was cancelled. The reason the flight was cancelled, as was the Gatwick, was because Orida didn't want to have the aircraft sitting in a UK airport because by that stage, taking the aircraft off the island, they in turn wouldn't get back into Guernsey in time to meet with their air traffic control uh, closing closing time. So they felt it better keeping the aircraft locally in Guernsey so they could at least fly the next morning flights out from the island. Brian, so that, that was their decision. Yeah, Brian, do you happen to know, I mean, are uh, the airports at Jersey, Guernsey and Alderney, are they up to strength with air traffic controllers? I don't know, to be honest. I don't know. I, I'm sure they're having the, the same sort of problems. Uh, the air traffic control position is a global problem. It's not just uh, the Isle of Man or the Channel Islands or Europe. It's a global problem, major problems in the States. I believe they're 4,000 air traffic controllers short in the States at this moment in time. And is that so because, is is that because of COVID? I think a lot of a lot of senior air traffic controllers uh, got to a point where they might have been in their early 50s and basically took the opportunity to retire. And that just left a huge void in, 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 in the system to an extent. But if we, if we then look at EasyJet, and you take EasyJet and, and some of the problems obviously we've been having from Gatwick, but also from Manchester and from Liverpool, is that they haven't got so much of a problem with the aircraft type. Their problem is, and it is high season, is that they're utilising their aircraft around Europe every day, which means that our flight is one of the last flights of the day. And in most cases, you're sitting for, a, say, a 6.30 flight from, from Gatwick, and it's delayed. And the problem with that delay is, is it's exacerbated because you then have to queue, uh, once you've got on the aircraft, to actually take off at Gatwick, and then you're out of time. So, so, um, so it's not so much the airport's fault, and I think the airport is getting a lot of criticism. In most cases, it's probably the airline's fault. And, uh, and, and their position 
is again very difficult and one that's not easy to resolve. Have you ever known this situation before, Brian? You've been in the travel business a while now. Yeah, so for 45 years this year, I think. And uh, yeah, we've seen many air- airlines come and go. Uh, most have gone through just financial failure. Uh, BA have gone probably half a dozen times in my lifetime in travel. Uh, will they come back? Well, let's keep our fingers crossed. It would be nice to have them back. Uh, EasyJet operates, I think, uh, a good service in and out of the Isle of Man, as do uh, uh, to uh, Logan Air. Uh, our governments are in the are in the process of doing an aviation review, and it'll be very interesting to see what they come up with. The last review was done in 2021, I think it was. Uh, we've certainly had an input on that. Uh, we're very, very, very sorry to, to lose our, our airport director, Gary Cobb, excellent airport director, uh, professional, knows his stuff, lots of experience, just built a brand new team around him from a board point of view. Uh, and we were very hopeful that things would be moving in the right direction there. So uh, uh, let's hope our government are doing everything they can to retain his services. Uh, they're very much needed. Well, what would you like the government to do? What would you like DOI to do with the airport? Well, I think we had a situation going back a number of years ago when they were talking about uh, a clo- open and closed sky position. And um, uh, I'm not an expert in aviation, but we've been around a long time. And we would say uh, maybe something between the two, not an open sky and not a closed sky, but certainly a regulated position where perhaps uh, routes are licensed to certain carriers and working to a, a very strict service level agreement where they had to operate within certain fare structures. They had to have certain number of uh, seats available at certain fares. They had to operate at strict times. And um, and maybe that was a more viable uh, position, particularly if we're, if we're shelling out £7 million a year in subvention to airlines to operate on our routes. So... Um, the difficulty is, of course, is, is that you know, we're now down to really uh, just a very small number of what we would call regional carriers. We've got Eastern Airlines, we've got, we've got Emerald, we've got Logan, and that's pretty much it. Um, so, um, you know, we, 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 we don't have an awful lot of choice, but if we, if we do want to run a successful island and we are looking to attract new people and new businesses into the island, uh, our airport and our routes uh, are essential. They're the vital lifelines to the Isle of Man, as is our ferry operator. So, uh, again, moving to the ferries, a lot of people might not realize is, in fact, that, uh, that Condor have recently been purchased uh, or are about to be purchased from Macquarie, uh, that were one of the original owners of the steam package. Yeah. Uh, they, they are being bought by Brittany Ferries. And Brittany Ferries will operate a route uh, through uh, the Channel Islands, down into France, and then possibly down to Spain as well. Now, that makes total sense. They've got the right ships. Uh, they, it's their own route to where they're going to. And I think that, that's, that'll be a very good marriage and, and a very good position for the Channel Islands from a ferry point of view. A lot of people might not realize that the, uh, the sister ship that is being used uh, uh, out of Guernsey at the moment uh, is actually the sister ship to our Ben. Oh, yes, she it's looks identical. just like the Ben, doesn't she? It, it's a sister ship, so, so uh, it's, it's identical. Um, but again, you know, the, the Brittany Ferry operation, they've got completely different types of ships, uh, uh, bigger than obviously our, our, um, our, uh, our Manxman, and certainly geared up for, for, for that sort of uh, situation. So that's a, that's a positive that obviously they negotiated. It has to be uh, sort of ratified by, the, by the, the, the Jersey and the Guernsey governments, but everybody thinks that's probably likely to happen. And, and that'll put them in a very different position moving forward from a, from a ferry link point of view. OK. Um, all right. Brian, we appreciate it. I appreciate your take on all this, obviously based on, is it really 45 years? Uh, Manning Travel was started in 1982. I was 21, so 43 years ago. That is something like that. It's a uh, long time ago. And you still look Uh, so young. There we go. All right. Thanks, Brian. (laughs) Cheers. Thank (laughs) you. Good to hear from you. And Howard's with us now. Hi, Howard. Hello, Andy. I just listened to Brian and saying a lot of common sense there, but uh, just as an extra bit to what he said about the Condor ferries, um, they've just bought another ship virtually identical to the Ben, and um, it's coming in from New Zealand to run parallel with their ships around Guernsey and Jersey, the uh, the Clipper, and uh, the one they've just bought. 
it's um, I say it's it's of the same family might be slightly different structurally a little mm. bit but they're all of the same family but I mean they've had problems um, uh, with Condor in the past haven't they Condor I think they fell out with the the harbour the port for a while and didn't run yeah. it it went bust I think so it just seems that the, the Channel Islands are getting it together whereas at the moment we, we look a bit lost at the airport uh, yes but what I was, uh, said to Howard when I first rang up was uh, as you know I was at the airport for quite a number of years and this is not a new thing uh, Cambrian when they were coming in the 1970s we referred to them as regret airlines because it used to be announced as we regret and then it was Flybe and again that uh, name that went on it may Flybe so it's not a new thing but the air traffic control um, CAA now well they're creating problems in so much that uh, there's very little of any leeway for these guys to stay behind. But not only that, it's not only the air traffic, um, and I think it may still stand. They had to remain at their post for, uh, I think it was 20 minutes after the aircraft had departed. This is landing, discharging passengers, taking on new passengers and leaving. They had to remain at their post for about 20 minutes. Uh, and the fire service and everything else attributable to it had to remain at the airport as well. Uh, this in case there was like uh, a turnaround and had to come back to the island. And I don't know whether that's still... Um, is in situ, but that's how it was when I was there because the aircraft used to take off and then air traffic would shut down about half an hour afterwards after the boys had got all that bits and pieces in order, but they had to remain in station there for at least 20 minutes after the aircraft had departed. Yeah. So these things, um, it's time factor, and if you haven't got a number of people and the CAA are given, making the rules, you can't move away from those rules because you would be downgraded then. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only trouble, and you wouldn't get the likes of um, aircraft from EasyJet and these um, BA, uh, British Airways, when you're doing your weekend out to Mallorca and places, that size of aircraft would be restricted. So it's, um, as Brian just said, it's a worldwide thing for air traffic control, and that's the only way around it. The DOA or the airport authority in the past few years on the island have let people go but not replace them. Okay. And now it's come back to bite them. All right. I appreciate that, Howard. Thanks for being with us today. Take care. Bye now. Good to hear from you. Well, there we are. We've sorted it out. We've sorted the employment uh, situation out. If you are, if you've just had your um, GCSEs and your A-levels, I now have the job for you. Air traffic controller. It's a job for life. Seems, doesn't it, as well, if there's that many short all around the world. Air traffic controller. If you want to... Uh, give the DOI a call. Maybe they've got a little career path for you to become an air traffic controller. Air traffic control is holding Isle of Man residents to ransom, says this texter. What's going on at the airport is shameful. Let's have the truth from those in charge instead of hiding in the shadows. Never mind attracting new residents to the Isle of Man. We'll be losing many existing residents at this rate. Useless, says Gary. And Gary Cobb's already explained the issues on the previous uh, Man in Life. Yeah, Mr. Cobb's been on a couple of times. Uh, lack of forward planning by previous management led to a lack of air traffic controllers. What's the betting that the government or DOI puts the running of the airport out to a private contractor to create a convenient arm's-length company to avoid all questions? Well, I'm not saying anything, but don't peel holdings run an airport. I'm just playing with you, honestly. That's it. Back with another open line tomorrow at high noon. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Thanks to Howie Kane on the phones today. W-I-N-T 60 years serving you as the nation station. This is Manx Radio. Kenny's Eye. Brought to you by Ellis Brown Architects. Peter, what's Kelly's eye looking at today? Today, David, I'm looking at an asbestos flue pipe. An asbestos flue pipe? 
I take it that's projecting from the top of the building opposite and has a little hat on it, is that right? That's it, it's, it's a little hat. It looks like one of those things that the hens used to drink water out of. <laughs> In fact, there's a seagull just arrived alongside it. Uh, that's attached to a metal flue pipe and it's on a roof of concrete uh, tiles and beneath it is a building which is pebble dashed which all sounds very much like a modern bungalow but in fact it's a building that goes back to the 1850s. Well you'll know it well as a place of employment but um, initially then it was just an ordinary dwelling was it? Well perhaps not an ordinary dwelling. um, There's a plaque on the door that says Hawthorne Villa um, AD 1858 yeah. which was put up at my suggestion because there used to be a very old plaque on the front of the building uh, in sandstone which had weathered and I've since discovered that it weathered so much that it wasn't 1858 it was actually 1853 Oh well, we won't worry about five years will we? <laughs> oh but I do because <laughs> it's not accurate um, it's now and has for many many years been the offices of Onkin Commissioners when it was built it was built for Mrs Chubb she was the widow of Commander Chubb, uh, Royal Navy. Chubb Safes? I don't know, but I mean, it's not a common name, so there's mm. a, a possibility. As usual, you, you employed a stone carter and you employed a mason and a joiner and so on. Anyway, rumour has it, or, or local tradition had it, that when she got the bill, um, I think from the stone carter, uh, it was considerably more than he'd estimated, so mm. she's supposed to have stood up on the chimney stack and said she wouldn't come down till he reduced the bill. Well, presumably he, he did reduce the bill because she obviously did come down, or if she didn't, there was no sign of her there in the 70s when, when they actually took the chimney stacks down, yeah. uh, and, and that's when we ended up with this asbestos right. flue pipe. At the same time, of course, as they put the concrete tiles on, they took out the original Georgian sashes, hack, hacked off the plain render, and, and sort of turned it into a macabre bungalow of the day. Many of the most iconic buildings around the island have been designed by Ellis Brown Architects. Keep up with Ellis Brown today on Facebook or by ellisbrown.im. Part of island life for 60 years. This is your Manx Radio.